welcome everyone uh, and as always thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us this afternoon i'm looking forward to our conversation today with doctors alhassan philippe and reese just want to start with a couple of housekeeping items before offering a land acknowledgement um, for these webinars, I usually request that people keep their videos and microphones off during the presentation. It'll let you make use of the hide non-video participants feature, which is going to spotlight the speaker. Um, we're going to set aside about 15 minutes at the end of our session today for questions. So um, if you have questions, make sure that you pop those into the chat. My name is Natalia Mason. I'm the Community Engagement Specialist in the Division of Social Accountability. I'm joining today from the College of Medicine's main campus in Saskatoon, which is on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Like most of you, my life has been enriched and sustained by the care and stewardship of these lands by Indigenous people. The DSA undertakes its work from an intersectional lens, which considers the relationship between power and varying forms of oppression. In a Canadian context, it's critical for us to be able to reflect on the historical and ongoing impacts of colonization on Indigenous people and traditions in our communities. My dad immigrated to Canada from a small island in the Caribbean called St. Lucia in pursuit of better opportunity for himself and his descendants. My mom's family were farmers who settled in the northeast part of the province. I know that the opportunities that have been afforded to myself and to my family haven't always benefited Indigenous peoples in the same way, and in some instances have likely perpetuated harm. Canada is a settler colony founded on colonization and genocide, and the oppression of Black and Indigenous peoples are currently and historically connected in this place and across the globe. It's a colonial history that brought me to this conversation today, but it's with a spirit of reconciliation and a commitment to good relationships that I center my work at this university. For those of you who are unfamiliar, the Division of Social Accountability is a division of the College of Medicine dedicated to health equity, anti-racist education, community-based research, advocacy, authentic partnerships, and the health needs of underserved and marginalized communities. We engage with and learn from our communities to support relevant, meaningful, and impactful health professional education, research, service, and advocacy. These health equity webinars are meant to support our students, faculty and staff learning in the College of Medicine, touching on some of the priority health needs of those in the communities that we serve. These webinars are always open invite, so I encourage you to spread the word to friends and colleagues. And I'm really excited to introduce our guest presenters for you this afternoon. Our first speaker will be Dr. Jacob Alhassan, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Community Health and Epidemiology. He is also an academic co-lead for the University of Saskatchewan's Global Health Certificate and a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry. Jacob is from Ghana and is trained in health administration, public policy and global health, African studies and population health from the universities of Ghana, Durham, Oxford and Saskatchewan. He's an activist scholar with a particular interest in political economy of health and educational inequities. He's guided by an anti-racist and anti-colonial praxis in his teaching, research, and learning, and loves mu music, poetry, and cooking. He is also the founder and board chair of Ad Astra Foundation Ghana, a Ghana-based youth-led nonprofit focused on promoting fair access to educational materials for children in rural communities. We are also joined today by Dr. Hugh Reese, a retired orthopedic surgeon who grew up in a grew up in small town Saskatchewan, went to medical school at the U of S, and interned in Saskatoon, practicing briefly as a family physician in various small towns across Saskatchewan. Returning to Saskatoon for an orthopedic residency and working in Saskatoon for 27 years as an orthopedic surgeon, he's always had a passion for improving healthcare in under-resourced areas of the world. Dr. Reese organized several surgical missions, first to Goma in Congo and later as a team lead for Team Broken Earth Saskatoon to Port-au-Prince, Haiti. He's been fortunate to develop relationships with physicians and allied medical staff in Haiti and locally. These liaisons have allowed the U of S to establish a six-week orthopedic observership program as well as a one-year training program in global orthopedic surgery at the U of S. And our last speaker today will be Dr. Peter Lee Philippe, who hails from Cape Aïtien, Haiti. His medical journey led him through the Faculty of Medicine and Pharmacy at the State University of Haiti from 2007 to 2014. 
In 2010, he took on a pivotal role as a founding member of the Haitian Association of Medical Students, assuming the presidency from 2013 to 2015. His specialization in orthopedics unfolded at the State University Hospital of Haiti from 2016 to 2020. Dr. Philippe broadened his expertise further during an associated internship in orthopedic surgery at the Metropole Savoy Hospital Center in Chambéry, France. Alongside his medical pursuits, Dr. Philippe also holds a diploma in football medicine. Driven by the vision to enhance healthcare accessibility in Haiti, particularly in orthopedics, Dr. Philippe is dedicated to leaving a lasting impact on healthcare delivery and outcomes in his home country. He's the inaugural recipient of the one-year training program in global orthopedic surgery, which started uh, in September of 2023. Dr. Philippe is confident that this program will significantly elevate his skills, empowering him to contribute effectively to the positive transformation he aims to achieve. So I hope that you will all uh, join me in welcoming our guest speakers. And uh, Jacob, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, um, Natalia. And thank you to everyone for making the time to join us for this session. I'm going to speak for the next um, 15 to 20 minutes, sharing a little bit about the work that I um, have been doing with uh, my colleagues here at the College of Medicine, specifically those involved with the Global Health Certificate. Um, and then hopefully we will be able to have Q&A at the end of um, the presentation. So I'm going to just share my screen. Um, can you all see my screen? I don't see anybody anymore. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, fantastic. So... Um, in terms of the presentation today, I'm just going to briefly talk through um, a two-year global health certificate that we have here at the um, College of Medicine that's focused on training medical students in um, global health, and also reflect a little bit on some of the ways that we're incorporating um, perspectives of decolonization in our work. You know, in response to you know some of the critiques that have been leveled against um, global health. So you see in the slide on this page um, the names of four students who you'll also be hearing from, um, who will describe how some of the things that I'm going to describe in the first part of my presentation have impacted their own learning um, as they you know strive to become physicians who are more socially aware and who are more interested in um, promoting health equity, whether it's in their own country, Canada in this case, or internationally, um, like people like um, Dr. Rees have um, done as careers over the last um, decades. So I'm Jacob as... Um, Natalia mentioned, and I, I moved to Canada in 2017. Um, I'm originally from Ghana, born and raised. My family lives in Ghana. And so um, I'm a settler here, as in some sense. I'm an immigrant, a newcomer um, in many ways. And so my work and everything that I'm going to say kind of comes from that perspective of someone who has lived in a low-income country, but also now lives in a high-income country and kind of tries to continue to straddle those two worlds as much as possible, trying to create whatever social change um, I might be able to help um, create. So <clears throat> I guess I should start by saying that the last, I would say four to five years have seen sustained critique of global health, um, you know, the discipline has been critiqued, you know, quite a bit, and rightly so, you know, from the 19th century onwards, there has been quite a dramatic interest in working to improve the health of people in other parts of the world, you know, compared to our own country. And in that whole process, right, in um in the in that in that in that time, the, the, the name they used to use was tropical medicine. And today we don't even say tropical medicine, now we say global health. Um, but this whole process of trying to improve the health of people in another part of the world as compared to your own part of the world has been criticized for different reasons because it has ended up being, among other things, um, you know, people from high-income countries showing up in low-income countries saying that they want to help improve the welfare of um, the people in those low-income countries, but in some cases ending up causing harm or ending up... Um, you know, engaging in activities that are probably more self-serving than necessarily improving the welfare and well-being of the people in those countries. And so in response to some of those kinds of critiques, 
you know, we have been trying to come up with ways of ensuring that when we travel internationally with our students, you know, as part of their global health training, that we're not falling into um, sort of the traps, I suppose, or the, entrap the entrapments that come with, you know, international placements where you have so much more resources than the people that you're working with internationally and you end up, you know, kind of tokenizing them, et cetera. And so these four principles that I'm going to describe are principles that I have um, sort of developed and implemented as part of my teaching in, in terms of the international placements. And I think that they are probably beginning to support and help, you know, the students that I work with to develop their own perspective, which, you know, is now slightly different than the way it has been done in the past. So these four principles are, like I said, principles aimed at making sure that when students are international, you know, and doing placements, et cetera, that they are not, um, acting like helicopter researchers or, you know, failing to build good relationships with community members or, you know, creating and perpetuating harms. So the first principle that I have found to be very useful in, you know, training students internationally has been what I call historicization, which is, an, you know, a very careful attempt at helping students understand the history of the space that they find themselves in. And, you know, the last placement that I have um, supported medical students through was a placement in Ghana where, you know, we essentially went to learn about the Ghanaian health system and work with communities in Ghana over a five-week period. And so for me, the historicization meant um, helping the students understand in, in West Africa, all over the coast of West Africa, you'll find that there are these slave dungeons and, you know, the connections between slavery and the history of medicine are not you know, necessarily well understood or not many people necessarily pay as much attention to how slavery and the development of slavery, you know, essentially helped the growth of medicine, modern medicine as we know it. So through, for example, you know, experimentation, but also how, you know, the spaces that people like, you know, slaves found themselves in offered fertile grounds for sort of what we would now call like natural experiments where, you know, you give vitamin C, so like, you know, lemons to one group of slaves compared to another group to see whether which of them is going to get cured of scurvy things like that so there are so many ways that medicine owes some debts to slavery and so we we try to teach this kind of thing to students so that they can see the historical dimension to the work that they are doing in the present um, this idea of complexity that i'm talking about is a way of ensuring that the medical students when they have gone internationally do not come back thinking that it's just a country of poor people or it's just a country where everybody is a certain way. Rather, we try to help them see the country in a more complicated way. So what do I mean by this? In most countries of the world, there are wealthy people and there are poor people, but it's not uncommon for people to go internationally and come back and say, oh, everybody was so poor and everything was so bad. So for as part of our placements, we would take the medical students to a very high tech private hospital for them to see what is possible even in a poor country and then to take them at the same time to a dilapidated rundown clinic where you know access to delivery is extremely difficult and they begin to see the contrast and they walk away with far more complication complexity in their minds than if they just went and came back to say oh everybody was so poor and i'm so grateful that i live in a sort of wealthy country which is the typical way that people will talk about this the humanization bit we basically try to incorporate principles of narrative medicine. So essentially getting medical students to interact directly with patients. Of course, the students that I'm taking with me are students who are still just finishing up their um, pre-clerkship. So they are not, you know, they're not yet at the, at the stage of their training where they are able to offer clinical care or anything like that. But through narrative medicine, we allow students to interact with patients through a sort of interview, you know, essentially, where they get to ask questions of the patients to understand the social determinants of health and the, you know, the, the contextual pieces to the life of the patient that is beyond, you know, the clinical um, symptoms that they may be showing or what they want to just talk about when you're trying to take a history of a patient. So that's kind of the idea here is to humanize um, the patient and let the student see the patient as a real person. And then the final thing to me is this idea of solidarity. So in working in partnership with communities, you realize that they have challenges and they are facing all kinds of um, difficulties in trying to 
you know, provide care. So how can you make sure that at the end of the day, you're not just walking away and saying, you know what, things were very hard for them and we were able to work with them for a little bit. Is there any way that you can give back to that community or that um, hospital? And in the case of the students that I took with me to Ghana, one of the things that they ended up doing when they came back to Canada, you know, after consultation with the hospital that they were with was to end up you know, doing a small fundraiser is, you know, it's not like they were Bill Gates and sending some millions of dollars, but I think it's a way of showing solidarity. It's a way of showing that even though you're not able to solve all the problems of the community that you have found yourself in, that you're able to contribute something, no matter how little it is. And so for me, incorporating these four principles have been quite useful in helping medical students have a very different perspective on um, their global health training and the role that they see you know, themselves having as physicians or future physicians. So in the slides that follow, I am going to have the medical students themselves share a little bit about how some of these principles that I'm talking about have kind of shaped their thinking as they find themselves either in rural Saskatchewan or in international context, how these kind of principles have shaped their thinking and as well their um, sort of training. So, so the four students that I um I'm talking about here are Lucas, Kande, Graham, and Kayla. So let's see if we can get this to play. Throughout our making the links experience, we learned of the structural inequities that permeate the medical field. These inequities, oftentimes perpetuated unconsciously, are rooted in historical, socioeconomic, and political realities of the past. During all three of our practicums, we were able to witness firsthand how some of these structural biases came to be and how they continue to pervade the healthcare sector to this day. For example, in Ghana, we had the opportunity to visit the slave castles of the Gold Coast. On this trip, we learned of the macro scale consequences of the transatlantic slave trade, including persistent health inequities in affected groups, as well as improvements in medicine as a direct result of the atrocities that occurred during this time, including the transmission of communicable diseases and the pathophysiology and management of severe malnutrition. For an example closer to home, we learn of the pernicious stereotypes that are foisted on Indigenous peoples in Canada and how our government was instrumental in creating and promulgating these stereotypes throughout our country's history. These negative stereotypes persist until today and can often dictate how interpersonal interactions occur in our emergency rooms and hospitals. It is important for us as future healthcare practitioners to recognize our own personal biases as well as work to dismantle those that pervade our institutions. As physicians, we must continue to improve our cultural humility and work with the communities we serve in order to better represent them in our future practices. Making the links gave me the opportunity to expand my understanding of health, both through theory and practice. The program works to provide us students with the information needed to understand health and health determinants within our community and well outside of it. The practical component further works to reinforce the knowledge acquired through the theoretical course. The practical aspect of the certificate is rooted in reflective practices, which not only helps to apply the theoretical knowledge, but it additionally works to further our understanding of health and communities that differ from our own. The certificate as a whole helped to broaden my perspective on health outside of the walls of my own hospitals. The program provided me with valuable knowledge and the opportunity to live and practice in different settings. This experience helped me to develop an understanding of health that is difficult to shake and sparked a desire to give back and to do better. In Saskatchewan, the West Mountain Rural Placements provided us with opportunities to engage in discussion around community needs with many different community members. Uh, our time in Westbound Community School gave us first-hand exposure of the inequities that lower socioeconomic neighborhoods frequently experience, such as the dangerous drinking water coming from their school taps, the poor quality and quantity of food the students received from home, and the lack of knowledge surrounding their own health. Although the specific needs of the communities were different in a rural practicum, the struggles and lack of governmental support felt similar. Specifically, in Isla Cross, a primarily Indigenous Northern community, we observed difficulties such as food shortages, poor access to an awareness of healthcare, and a gradual generational deterioration in cultural identity. In both of these practicums, the skills, knowledge, and personal stories that we learned were not something that you would ever fully understand unless you were actively involved in these communities. 
Making the Links provides an opportunity for the stories of community members to be passed throughout the province, providing more and more awareness and advocacy for individuals who struggle to achieve some of their most basic human needs. These placements have provided us with the goals of improving cultural humility, healthcare, and societal advocacy for the needs that many of us take for granted, yet several, several communities still do not have. We spent our time in the classroom on theory-based lectures and readings so that when we entered a community, our experiences were guided by an understanding of the social and structural determinants of health impacting the people we were working with, such as structural violence through strategic economic development and neglect of the northern part of a country, and how this then translates to a north versus south health divide. This is something we recognized in Ghana, but also back home in Saskatchewan, where northern communities face significant barriers to healthcare access due to factors such as poor road infrastructure. We also engaged in guided reflexive practice with our mentors during our experiences to analyze our self position in real time and the ways in which our presence can affect the community and our interactions within it. We will carry these lessons forward into the patient care aspects of our undergraduate medical training to better understand the experiences and perspectives of patients in our home community. This program has built a strong foundation for my own personal and professional growth, and I'm so grateful to have had this training early on in my career as it will inform my future practice in medicine and has empowered me by building my knowledge and skill set for social accountability and advocacy. So in terms of, um, you know, the placements that the students are talking about the the program that we um that we run is structured around you know placing them in community in Saskatchewan but also placing them in community internationally and this process can be quite complicated just because you know the um the socio demographic characteristics of the people who live in the community that the students are going to can be quite different from the students themselves and so there's always the risk that the students um maybe go and do not behave in ways that we find to be um appropriate for their training and so I think a big thing that we have had to do a lot as part of improving the partnership that we have with the community members as well as um, you know improving the students technical capacities has been you know reflective practice where essentially among other things we do not just place students in you know community organizations or clinics you know internationally or in Saskatchewan but we actually create as much as possible you know, opportunities for the students to reflect on what they're learning in the community, what they see to be the needs of the community, and to discuss that with us as instructors. Um, and through these discussions, they're able to, you know, understand some of the stereotypes or biases or, you know, ideas that they may have about communities that may be, you know, probably incorrect. And then we then offer readings and, you know, other resources and material that allows the students to be able to, um, kind of situate and contextualize the ideas, you know, and understandings that they are gaining from the conversations that we're having. And I think in my experience so far, you know, I would say fairly confidently that the perspective that the students were sharing in these videos are very, very different from the perspective they had when they first came into the program, just because, you know, exposure to international partners and things like that can be useful, but it's not that easy to do on your own in a good way. And so I find that, you know, this, conscious attempt that we're making to sort of decolonize, you know, these global health placements and to kind of make sure that our partnerships are characterized by reciprocity. So the solidarization slide, slide that I had at the beginning, where we're not just showing up in clinics and expecting, you know, you know, physicians or nurses who are already, un, you know, who are already underpaid and stressed out in low income center settings to just accept our students and do whatever we need you know, rather we work with them trying to identify the needs that they may have, you know, in their in their communities and figure out how our students might actually be able to genuinely um, contribute to improving the health of people, whether it's in a rural community in Saskatchewan or um, a community in another part of the world um, has been very, very kind of telling and we have seen that it has been very transformative for some of the students with some of them making it very clear to us at the end of these placements that they will they will travel internationally in the future to provide care right to support the well-being of um, people in other parts of the world um, 
you know, this coming, this is, uh, this is March. So in May, June, I will be kind of going back out there again with medical students and, you know, armed with these principles that I have been um, discussing, we will again create opportunities for students to learn about the history. So in this particular um, coming summer, the plan is for me to go to um, Ghana, where we have partners there, um, Vietnam, where we have partners, and as well, Australia. And in all of these places, the challenge is to help students understand the history of these very different places and how they relate to medicine and medical practice, um, to think about how to humanize the people that they'll encounter during these placements, right? So that they see them as real, normal human beings, just like themselves too. And that's what creates the respect and the partnership moving forward. As well, um, like I've been saying, you know, creating a sense of complexity so that they don't just come back and think, oh, Australia is just like this, or, you know, Vietnam is just this, or that trying to create this sense of complexity in their mind so that they don't just think that it is one thing or another, but a complicated place, just like any other part of the world. And finally, um, you know, putting in that attempt for them to sort of build a sense of solidarity and feel that there's something that they could do and should be trying to do um, to help improve the health of people in those parts of the world. So I hope that this, you know, brief discussion has given a sense of what I do and how, you know, we are trying to incorporate decolonization into the work that we're doing. So thank you. And I'll pass it over to Dr. Rees. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks, Jacob. Interesting talk. Um, and thanks, Natalia, for asking me to uh to come and uh uh Peter Lee as well. Uh we're both really happy to have the opportunity to discuss this program. Um uh, uh, so I initially thought that this talk was maybe a more focused toward medical students. Now I see based on the names that are uh, in attendance that I'm um, more preaching to the choir than I, than, uh, than I expected. So, um, however, I'm happy to have this opportunity to discuss the program that we have because um, it is uh, very relevant to what Jacob was talking about. I think it dovetails nicely with his talk. Um, so uh, I'll be your host for this this part of the webinar, uh, and Peter Lee and I will be available uh, together then for the uh, question and answer uh, session afterwards. So there are three main components of this talk, uh, the Global Orthopedic Fellowship uh, that uh, we've created at to the U of S, um, Team Broken Earth, which I might refer to as TBE from time to time, uh, and building relationships, but all these components are related and intertwined, and you'll see uh, a lot of uh, intertwining of what we've discovered over the years uh, with what Jacob uh, was uh, talking about as well. So uh, in the next 20 minutes, we'll describe the Global Orthopedic Surgery Fellowship at the U of S, introduce you to the Canadian medical charity team, Broken Earth. Uh, and discuss building relationships, uh, primarily between uh, Haitian and Canadian orthopedic surgeons. Um, first, I'll introduce you to uh, the Global Orthopedic Fellowship. This slide says name because uh, even though I'm calling it the Global Orthopedic Fellowship, the preferred name by the U of S College of Medicine and the various licensing bodies in Saskatchewan is not a fellowship, but rather a focused competency program in international medical graduates, um, but I'll just call it a fellowship pro program. It's the same thing. The start date for the first fellowship was September 1st, 2023, and it is designed for orthopedic surgeons who've completed their residency in another country 
but would not typically have access to a traditional Canadian fellowship uh, position because uh, the traditionally required Canadian licensing examinations uh, uh, that uh, like the LMCC and uh, USMLE, uh, they, they don't have and can't get. So uh, more specifically, it's directed toward orthopedic surgeons who are devoted to practicing and making a positive impact in their home country that would otherwise not have been able to access one of the fellowships here. So first candidate uh, you'll see um, a little bit later on is uh, the legendary Dr. Peter Lee Philippe from Cap Haitian Haiti. The stakeholders in this fellowship are orthopedic surgeons and uh, allied healthcare professionals, uh, including uh, nurses, physiotherapists, residents, um, uh, medical students, everyone in Saskatoon, as well as orthopedic surgeons practicing surgery uh, practicing orthopedic surgery in low and middle income countries. And I see uh, Fevry in the list of people that are here today too. So hi, Fevry. Uh, the stakeholders in this, uh, 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 sorry. Yeah, the design of this program is um, a traditional orthopedic fellowship that's been heavily modified, specifically created and designed for orthopedic surgeons practicing in low and middle income countries. Uh, I was designed through direct collaboration with surgeons and residents from Haiti, as well as local surgeons and staff. And, and to give you an example of what I talk about, um, I mean, I've been primarily a foot and ankle surgeon for most of my career. Uh, and uh, a high percentage of what I've done is not, even though it's orthopedics, uh, is not relevant in any way to what Peter Lee uh, needs uh, to do in Haiti. Uh, for example, I'd have a full day of full day OR slate of correcting bunions. And uh, I think Peter Lee and February will both tell you that that's just not something that's needed in uh, Haiti. So uh, the purpose of this program is to benefit local surgeons, residents, uh, and allied healthcare professionals. In other words, we get as much out of it, if not more, uh, as uh, the surgeons do from low and middle income uh, countries. So what do I mean by this? Well, local surgeons benefit from being exposed to this broader worldview. And this is what Jacob was talking about, um, is... Uh, the only way to really understand what's going on is to expose people to it. Um, and uh, a great way to expose people to uh, it is uh, one, to take them to other countries or other environments, and two is to bring people from other environments here uh, for enough time that they can actually have a valuable discussion. Um, so our local surgeons benefit from that, and they also benefit from the knowledge that's brought uh, by people like Peter Lee about how you treat orthopedic conditions in uh, an austere environment. And the other benefit for our local surgeons is that they get another resident to share the load. And there is always a lot of work to do uh, as a resident. Uh, even though Peter Lee comes here as a fellow, he does a lot of work as a resident. So that's the benefit that we get from it, uh, which is really quite significant. Uh, the benefit that uh, we think and hope that surgeons from low and middle income uh, countries get from it um, is exposure to uh, the treatment options that we have, the equipment that we have, uh, uh, the volume of surgery that we can do because of the uh, uh, conditions we have. Uh, but I think more importantly, it's to make lasting relationships with the local staff here for future collaborations. And, and I think that our idea has always been uh, to leverage this opportunity to um, make relation, build relationships and uh, elevate the standard of uh, care in um, low and middle income countries whenever it's possible. So our aim is to ensure that the fellow has a high quality and relevant experience and to ensure that they can provide uh, best possible care for patients using the resources they have at home. Um, we also hope they can facilitate uh, communication among peers at home and disseminate this information as much as possible. Um, and our ultimate goal is to increase availability of resources. So the background there, that's Bernard Mev's hospital in Haiti. Um, and the inset is uh, Henny, me, and uh, Ken Kesley, who was one of the uh, orthopedic uh, 
observers here in Saskatoon. So I'm going to tell you uh, more specifically now about the Global Orthopedic uh, Fellowship and how it evolved. It evolved actually over a number of years. It took at least seven years to get it up and running. It started um, the um, uh, the whole process started in 2016 with our first Team Broken Earth mission to Haiti. And I will tell you a little bit more about Broken Earth uh, in the next few slides. But uh, uh, anyway, in 2016, my wife, Henny, and I took a team of approximately 30 local health care professionals uh, from Saskatoon to Haiti. This, uh, this is a big team, included four orthopedic surgeons, an orthopedic resident, plastic surgeon, general surgeon, radiologist, and a couple of intensiv intensivists as well as OR and ICU nurses and a physiotherapist. And Jacob alluded to the issues that you can see by doing that. Um, so TBE Saskatoon ultimately completed four yearly missions to Haiti. Uh, our staff varied somewhat from year to year, but we had roughly 60 people involved in this program over the years. Our last TBE mission to Haiti was in 2019. Uh, and even that mission, we were the last TBE team to go to Bernard Mev's hospital in Haiti. Uh, and that was cut to air too short due to increased political violence in Haiti. The po political violence, even in 29, you guys, it escalated to the point that we had to evacuate our team uh, with an armed guard. Uh, and we've been unable to return do then. To, uh, we've been unable to return to Haiti since then. Granted, in 2020, obviously it was due to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, but uh, even with or without the COVID-19 pandemic, we still wouldn't have been gone, uh, we would not have been able to go back because of the ever increasing violence in Haiti. When we left, we thought it couldn't get worse, but um, it was bad then. And I know Peter Lee will agree with me that it's a lot worse now. And you hear about Haiti uh, now almost every day in the news. Overall, um, even though these missions still carry on, uh, not so much uh, in Haiti, obviously, but there is a general trend in global surgery uh, away from team-style short-term surgical missions. And there are a lot of good reasons for this. It's uh, uh, it, uh, too many, really, to sort of compress into this discussion. But I'll just talk about the math of it first. And to give you an example of the math, uh, we had to fundraise somewhere between $130,000 and $150,000 to take a fully staffed surgical team uh, and equipment from, Port uh, from Saskatoon to Port-au-Prince in Haiti for one week. During that time, uh, we could do 30 or 40 surgeries uh, and we could provide you know, a relatively limited uh, number of lectures and training sessions. And really that was about it. That's all we could do. In contrast, if you bring... Peter Lee to Saskatoon, an orthopedic surgeon from Haiti, for an entire year of training, it costs roughly $70,000 or uh, approximately half of what it took to get our team there for a week. But Peter Lee can go back, he can treat thousands of patients. He's already then developed a well established re relationship with surgeons here. So it, it, it seems obvious to me that the cost versus benefit ratio is tipped in favor of training and providing resources uh, for surgeons uh, in low and middle income company and countries rather than parachuting in these uh, specialized surgical teams. I, I don't think that there's much doubt that uh, 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 healthcare professionals in low and middle income countries, including uh, uh, Peter Lee and the residents, uh, nurses and patients, can get much more benefit from an ongoing exchange of information uh, with someone like Peter Lee who's familiar with their language and culture than from someone like me who grew up in Moss Bank um, and uh, just comes in with a, a group of his friends for, for, for a week. It, I think, seems uh, oftentimes to people uh, that are involved in global surgery, and I think this is why it perpetuates it, it's much sexier to assemble a local team uh, to then go to a country and help uh, than it is to bring someone here uh, and provide them with uh, you know, much needed resources. But uh, even though it's the sexiest model, it really is, it does not seem that it is the best. Um, I've had this conversation with Peter Lee, I've had it with Fevery, I've had it with uh, Ken, who's in this picture here. 
And they all stated really quite clearly that the most useful thing that we could do for a Haitian orthopedic resident or surgeon is to have access to provide access to a North American fellowship. And uh, it's because of these conversations that the ball got rolling to do that. So the next step in the evolution of the program was to create a six week observership position. And we did that for a lot of different reasons. One is to see if we could actually do it uh, and bring someone here. And the second is to um, make uh, um, sure as best we could that people were comfortable with each other. So this collaboration, collaboration started in 2017, a year after our first mission to Haiti with a four week observership that was set up by a friend of ours named uh, Josh Mayich, uh, who's in St. John, New Brunswick, another orthopedic surgeon. And initially, we split the program between New Brunswick and Saskatoon. It was two weeks there and two weeks here. Uh, as with our missions, uh, that stalled for COVID-19. We had Peter Lee, and then we had Ken's here for these programs, and then it stalled for two years and then was reinstated in a different form afterwards. Josh had moved on to do different things. And uh, there was no, he was no longer in St. John, New, uh, New Brunswick. So we consolidated the observership position in Saskatoon, made it a six week position instead of a four week. That position now is well established uh, at the U of S. We've had four candidates in total. Peter Lee was the first. Uh, the funding was initially by TBE. But now we have funding for this program promised from the Saskatchewan Orthopedic uh, Association for the foreseeable future. So I would say the six week observership is ingrained in the program. So uh, that was um, a toe in the door. However, our ultimate goal was not to bring people here for six week observership. All you can do in an observership really is as, as it says, you can watch, it's hands off. Um, and what we really wanted was a true one-year fellowship where there was actual participation, true longitudinal engagement uh, of colleagues over time. The observership was really actually quite straightforward to set up. It wasn't very difficult at all, but the fellowship most certainly was not. In fact, uh, initially setting up the fellowship seemed impossible. Um, and this was because of these decades old local regulations that uh, prohibited these programs from even existing. So it was lots and lots of discussion, lots and lots of email and many and many, uh, many, many people that were involved in making this happen. There were uh, friendly, kind, intelligent and extremely patient people like Peter Lee and his colleagues in Haiti and um, understanding and willingness to help of uh, the staff at uh, the Division of Orthopedics here, Department of Surgery, College of Medicine at the U of S, Saskatchewan Orthopedic Association, College of Physicians and Surgeons of Saskatchewan, and the Canadian Medical Protective Association. So you can see just by the number of players in that sentence how um, many people you have to talk into this. But we were ultimately able to make it happen. The 2023-2024 fellowship, as I said, started September 1st, 2023, uh, is funded by Team Broken Earth. But next year, uh, the funding will uh, come from Saskatchewan Orthopedic Association, the College of Medicine, and also the Division of Social Accountability. So we did it. We're really happy this program finally exists, but we just feel that this is a starting point, not an end point, and we don't feel we can rest here. We just can't assume that this program is great. Uh, we need to evaluate it. Uh, and ensure that what we think is correct is correct. So we need to obtain objective evidence of outcomes. And uh, uh, I mean, we're orthopedic surgeons, we're simple bone setters. We're not experts in quality assurance and program evaluation. So we've asked for help from the Division of Social Accountability and we're developing a liaison with the Division of Social Accountability in order that we can accumulate objective evidence to support this program. If indeed we can show that this program is as good as we think it is, then there's no reason we can't take this program, duplicate it in other orthopedic programs across Canada. There are 17 orthopedic programs across Canada. And then if we can establish it across Canada in uh, uh, these various orthopedic programs, then there's no reason that it can't be established in other surgical programs and medical subspecialty programs and established across Canada uh, with that. So that's our, where, we're, um, we're swinging for the fences. We're not trying for an infield bunt. 
So by now you've heard that I've mentioned this Team Broken Earth charity a few times. Um, some of you, quite a few of you listening to this talk will know about it already. Um, so I'm just going to briefly describe it for those that don't know about it. It's a Canadian medical charity founded in 2010 by two surgeons, an orthopedic surgeon, Andrew Fury, and plastic surgeon, Art Rideout in St. John's, Newfoundland. And if you think you've heard the name Andrew Fury before, it's yes, you have. He's the premier of Newfoundland. It's the same guy. And he's in the news a lot lately dealing with the fisheries. Um, it was founded initially in response uh, to the devastating earthquake in Haiti in 2010. It was initially patterned primarily on the surgical mission model. Uh, again, as we know, a somewhat flawed model, but it was improved by the fact that we had consistent follow-up and an educational component. So even though teams were going for one-week surgical missions, there was a team going almost every month and going to the same hospital and engaging as much as possible with local staff. Um, I mean, the evidence that we engage with local staff is obviously that uh, Peter Lee is here. Um, uh, the TBE organization has evolved to include multiple teams in multiple countries, uh, and they don't only go to Haiti now, or not Haiti now, obviously, anymore, but uh, they've shifted to Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. Um, uh, TBE is constantly evolving as a develop an understanding of the best way to create surgical and medical partnerships with uh, uh, low and middle income countries. Education has always been an integral component of the TBE philosophy. Um, I think it's very important to mention them because they have been an absolutely essential partner in establishing a global orthopedic fellowship program at the U of S. Um, uh, they've been extremely reliable to deal with uh, and I know where the money goes within this organization. Uh, this uh, group of people here is the first TBE Saskatoon crew. That's from a picture of 2016 and they're in uh, uh, the Bernard Mevs hospital in Port-au-Prince. So the next, the third uh, part of this talk is uh, building relationships and historically, and again, Jacob alluded to this as well, relationships between physicians from high income countries and low and middle income countries have produced, I would say at best, inconsistent results. People have different motivations for becoming involved in global surgical initiatives. They often talk instead of listen. And despite oftentimes good intentions, they can make things worse instead of better. In fact, sometimes they can make them a lot worse. And I'll just give you an example of that. In the case of this, the cholera e epidemic uh, after the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, um, Haiti actually hadn't had a case of cholera for decades prior to the earthquake. Uh, so uh, there was an earthquake, then there was a cholera epidemic. And the cholera epidemic was thought most likely to be imported by aid workers from countries where cholera was, was endemic. So <laughs> that definitely takes a bad situation and makes it way worse. So that's on a huge level, but sometimes the harm is created on a more individual and personal basis. For example, um, you, you know, uh, cowboy surgeons will roll in, uh, do complex surgeries, uh, which uh, have low percentage outcomes and can develop, can uh, make people worse, can cause infections and can result in um, uh, individual disasters rather than uh, disasters of many people. Um, due to the internet and maybe due to some extent to pictures of the earth from space, global awareness is increasing and political borders are becoming increasingly recognized, at least by some, hopefully by more as time goes by as the artificial divisions that they really are. Um, no matter how we identify as individuals, there's no denying that we're all in this together. It's essential that we recognize the fact that studying and learning medicine does not stop at the Canadian border. So it's time to wrap this up. Uh, and what I've done is introduce you to the new Oval Orthopedic Global uh, Fellowship Program at the U of S and to Team Broken Earth. I only had a few brief slides on building relationships at the end of the presentation, uh, but truly the entire presentation uh, and Jacob's presentation prior to mine has been about demonstrating the importance of building relationships in the global medical community. The Global Orthopedic Fellowship Program at the U of S is brand new. 
it's fragile. And the reason it's fragile is due to lack of funding. And because it's so new, although we're fairly certain we're on the right track, uh, we want to ensure that we are and we need more objective data. We thought we were on the right track doing these missions and now we're not so sure. So we think we're on the right track with this, but we have to always reevaluate. If it is as valuable as we think it is, um, it can be replicated and evolved to include multiple centers and multiple surgical and medical subspecialty areas. If you are interested in Team Broken Earth and don't already know about it, as I know a few, few of you do, I encourage you to ask about the organization or visit their website. Um, in conclusion, it's all about building relationships and being curious and the provision of ad adequate health care shouldn't stop at the Canadian border. Uh, I think we can all do something about this. We can all get involved. Uh, if you are a student uh, listening to this or someone that hasn't yet had any involvement in global surgery but like, would like to, the first step is increasing your awareness. And um, a lot of people I know that are listening to this uh, talk will already realize um, shocking statistics uh, like the fact that only 60 to 70 percent, sorry, that that 60 to 70 percent of the global population do not have access to something as simple as an x-ray. Um, but if you are listening to this talk, uh, obviously, and uh, looking at the audience, you've already taken a step toward this um, and just have to remember uh, to try and take careful, thoughtful and reasonable action and, and try not to do any harm. Um, I'm I, again, I'm glad to have this opportunity to speak to everybody. Um, and I'm glad I, I hope I can work together with some of you more in the future and we can make a difference in uh, global medicine. I, uh, you know, Peter Gabriel says you can blow out a candle, but you can't blow out a fire. So thanks very much. That is uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Reese. Um, such a fascinating presentation, and I think it was so neat to see some of those principles that Jacob was speaking to already um, embodied in the work that you do and um, a lesson that you've kind of learned along the way, and hopefully that's something that can carry forward. I've got a question for you, Dr. Philippe. Um, how do you think that you're going to have to adapt um, the experience that you've gained in Canada in order to be able to practice in Haiti? Thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> I've been practicing orthopedics since 2020. And before coming to Canada, I've been in France for six months. And whenever, wherever I go, uh, I see some things that they do differently. And what is very helpful about coming here in Canada is to see all the equipment we have available here and what I do. And I try to imagine how I can do the same procedure with different equipment that I could find at home. So I try to organize and between what I could do differently with equipment I could find at home. And I also try to find what equipment I necessarily need. And if I know what I will need, I can plan to buy them and or to try a way to find them. And I couldn't do that if I didn't know all the surgery are performed and what you can use to do them. Brilliant. Thanks for that. And this question's from Deidre. So a bit of an expansion on that for uh, Hugh and Peter Lee. Have you given any thought to adaptations for the uh, training projects so that you can account for those kinds of differences in terms of access to orthopedic implants um, in Canada versus Haiti? Sorry, can you repeat? Yeah. How have um, how has the training project been adapted to account for differences in access to orthopedic implants in Canada versus Haiti? So is that something that you've kind of thought about, Hugh? Yeah, so this is all part of it. it, it and that's um, uh, that's uh, down the road uh, comes uh, under the heading of building relationships, right? 
Um, and there, uh, it's the subject of another hour long talk. Um, it's definitely uh, on our radar. And in order to ensure that equipment is available, you have to have two things. You have to have money and you have to find the equipment. Um, and we have to unite all the players to do that. So the two components are uh, finding how we're, orthopedic equipment is expensive, right? Is to uh, find how we're gonna do that and working through um, the Canadian Orthopedic Association for Global Surgery, uh, we are looking towards um, sort of consolidating how funding is, um, how we can get funding uh, in Canada and how we can provide that to, in a global situation. And the second thing is to hold local orthopedic equipment companies accountable for global surgery. And this is another um, sort of a personal um, part of my project because they, um, there are about five big orthopedic equipment companies and they all claim that they have charitable organizations and they're they're um, doing uh, all these things to further global health, but uh, it's not as evident to me as it should be. So, uh, so uh, again, it's all the organizations have to come together. We're going to use the Canadian Orthopedic Association for Global Surgery in the near future to leverage the Canadian Orthopedic Equipment Companies to um, help contribute to um, contribute equipment to places where it's needed. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's a long process because it's one thing to get a van load of uh, hip replacements and it's a whole other thing to get sustained funding for equipment over the years, right? And it's, again, it goes back to what Jacob was talking about. It's like, it's no point in just showing up with 50 components. That just doesn't do any good. What we need to do is establish a liaison an equipment source for Peterly that is um, accessible and affordable. So it's it's something we're doing. It's part of it. I I appreciate that emphasis on the advocacy piece and also you know helping to understand the impact that Canadian industries, for example, have on access to um, necessary equipment in other places in the world. So uh, kudos to you for taking on some of that advocacy work. Um, we were right at 1.30, but there's a question in the chat. So um, I'll give you the chance to answer that. And if there's people that have to pop off, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this question's from Dr. Razzi. He said, Hugh, are there any estimates of the extent of medical or orthopedic equipment wastage obsolescence in Canada, which can be regularly utilized elsewhere? Uh, I don't have those numbers. Um, that is uh, another big can of worms because uh, the bottom line is if the equipment is not satisfactory to be used here, it's not satisfactory to be used anywhere. Um, that said, uh, there is uh, equipment here that's deemed obsolete that there's nothing wrong with it. So it's a, it's a tightrope. Uh, so in the short answer to your question is no, I don't have uh, the, uh, the data on that. The long answer is there is a lot of equipment that still has good shelf life and is very usable. Um, and uh, that's all sort of a component of what we're trying to do as well. We just have to be careful that like everybody gets the same standard, right? So yeah, but uh, it's tough. Great question. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, um, thank you all for uh, sharing your wisdom and your experience with our audience today. It was a really informative presentation. I'm also certain that there are some connections brewing in minds um, and hopefully in email inboxes um, later so that all of us can collaborate and coordinate on these kinds of initiatives and ensure that the relationships that we build um, across borders, across countries are meaningful um, and that the healthcare that we're able to provide continues to be actually helpful and not harmful um, to those that we're engaging with. Um, to everyone who joined us today, again, thank you very much. You'll receive a follow-up email with access to a recording um, from today's, today's presentation in addition to a survey. And we'll hope to see you in for April's webinar 
We haven't chosen a date yet, but that will be in your inboxes soon as well. And again, just a massive thank you to all three of you for joining us for today's presentation. There's lots of thanks pouring in in the chat there.